Hi, welcome to another episode of Swaraj Conversations. This is our special episode series in the lineup of the Budget 2021. Today we have with us Dr. Sohala. He is an Indian economist, author, columnist, and currently the executive director for India at the International Monetary Fund. Sir, thank you so much for sparing the time out of your busy schedule. Yeah, and my pleasure. we talking about the budget 2021 if i just go back a year ago we were talking about the five trillion economy goals we're talking about so many different things one year later everything has changed we are suddenly talking about atmanirbharta we're talking about reforms and the budget is the time when there's time for the big bang reforms you see the big bang reforms with the budget but this year has been different the government has those re- um you know the budget you said is the time for big bang reforms that's actually not the case uh it i believe it should be the case uh but over history there are very very few reforms uh very very few budgets rather that have the characteristic big bang reform this year the expectations are high uh because the government has introduced several reforms outside of the budget itself um so what one is looking for is now a summary statement of the reforms that have happened and a vision uh of where we are headed as you said we had the uh covid scare worldwide um just about this time is when it started um in the us and in a few countries and i think january 28 so um this is a time where i think um <clears throat> striking feature of what has happened over the last year in india and elsewhere is that every country brought about short term response uh which was in terms of making credit more freely available spending uh money in the budget uh, on uh transfer of incomes to those who are most needy uh and basically um reacting to the crisis um and very appropriately so so i think you know the countries have to be commended uh for that and the imf uh, the institution of imf has a policy tracker and that policy tracker uh lists all the short term responses of various countries and is publicly available as well now what is interesting is that there isn't a parallel um accounting or parallel website where you can go and look at the list of the forms structural reforms that countries have undertaken in this year as you know there's the old refrain don't waste a crisis and you know yesterday biden was uh, sworn in and his uh policy makers were stating more or less the same thing that we are in a crisis stage and this is a time to bring about reforms well in a study that i have done um it turns out that over the last year the covid year india has been way in above uh any other country in its attempt to bring about structural reforms within the covid year so this is not related to the budget but it is related to what i said earlier that there is now a vision and by far so and you know there are less than 10 countries actually but five or six which introduce some form of structural reforms uh greece is one of them brazil is another indonesia is a third but the government has been on overdrive <laughs> uh and very uh thankfully so uh and needs to be complimented on uh the various set of reforms uh that they have structural reforms have brought about so 
That's by way of introduction. Now looking to the budget, uh, there are some uh, significant uh, reforms they can do, and perhaps we can talk about that now. So let's jump into the budget 2021. The structural reforms have been made. If you look at the budget 2021, the finance minister has already remarked that this will be a budget unlike any other. But what are your aspirations? If I say, what is your wish list for the 2021 budget, if I may put it that way? Yeah. No, everybody's got a wish list. I certainly have mine. Uh, as I said, so if I were um, doing the budget, uh, I would um, wish for, hope for, uh, and recommend the following. First, a budget, the, just in terms of the optics, the budget need not be a very long uh, duration. I would say if you're going about one hour, uh, you're beginning to do something wrong. In that one hour, uh, you can have your terminal couplets and whatever, uh, which I think add a lot uh, to the budgets. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think it's, uh, but after that or within that, um, there has to be a vision statement. And a vision statement should include how uh, the, we have responded uh, over the last year. Um, and we've thought about structural reforms. We are changing the contours of the economy um, and how this budget is part of that vision. And I would then spell out the vision. Uh, a more open economy where individuals have more freedom, uh, where, you know, reform means you're changing something. And here what you're changing as in farm laws, I know they've been put in abeyance uh, for a year, but uh, I would, you know, take the reference from the farm laws as to how it provided more freedom for every farmer. And uh, so that would be about economic freedom uh, that individuals should be free uh, to act within constraints, obviously not an anarchy, but uh, there should be greater individual uh, freedom, especially individual economic freedom. Second, uh, I would really, budget is about taxes and expenditures. And uh, on taxes, we need uh, several reforms. Um, we still have the retrospective tax on the books. No. Um, various finance ministers and uh, this government in both the earlier uh, phase one or Modi one and Modi two has uh, argued for the removal of, of this retrospective tax. I think uh, that would be a very, very simple, straightforward, there's no debate on it. You're not going to have uh, people who are affected by the tax come out. Of, I don't know who benefits, benefits from retro. Nobody's going to be protesting in the streets. So that's in fits in well with the budget and fits in well with the vision. The in addition to that, I would uh, take a step forward on the corporate taxes, um, where the uh, FM, uh, Ms. Sita Raman, had taken a very uh, bold uh, move and initiative in October of 2019. That, you know, it seems like a lifetime away. It's only a year or so uh, since that reform was brought in. And there was a hint in those reforms about lowering the tax rate further uh, so that if we are more competitive uh, with uh, the international um, regime and therefore um, more, uh, it will only help in terms of uh, the growth rate uh, as well as compliance. Which brings me to Look, a major story about tax, it's not so much about tax rates, but it's about tax compliance. What do you do in structural 
in, in developing economies which haven't. And I think even mature economies are facing this task. Uh, though they have more information available, uh, their tax regime has been in place. But I, I think the number one goal uh, is to increase tax compliance. Once you take that view, the, your number one goal, which will increase tax, uh, is tax compliance. Then you start looking at the determinants of tax compliance. And what you find universally is a major determinant of tax compliance are tax rates. Right. In India, the as even today with 22% corporate tax rate, it's about five to seven percentage points higher than all of our competitors. So I think um, if you want to be competitive and reach a $5 trillion economy in due time, uh, this is one of the things, you know, very interesting along, the government has op really opened up the economy for foreign investment, um, and uh, domestic production. Um, this is just what will be the killer punch uh, if we were to reduce the corporate tax rate further by at least four percentage points. I'm hoping, uh, or my recommendation would be to go to 15. And on the direct taxes, um, basically, Every government, including this, has argued, every government, I, I should say, for the last 10 years, has argued for reform of the direct tax code. That, to me, from a budget standpoint, is the number one uh, priority. As I said, we are halfway there, or maybe two-thirds of the way there on corporate taxes, but we haven't even, you know, just think about it. The 30% tax rate, uh, when it was introduced in 97, applied to 0.1% of the working population. And today it applies to 50, 60% of, the work, of those who pay taxes, very abnormal. Um, and which is why I think uh, the direct uh, reform is absolutely uh, the first priority. And within that, it is we want to increase tax compliance so we can fund various ambitious uh, and justified goals that the government has. And uh, this is a major way of getting there. Uh, indeed, I don't know any other way of uh, increasing tax revenue from direct taxes. And just to add, I mean, the surcharges, uh, you know, they should just be removed. Um, complete the question of cesses. Hmm. So let us say, and there is a rationale for cesses, um, which is basically the center. Uh, you know, the center has committed itself uh, in 2014 uh, for compensating the uh, state for any shortfall, the Commission looked at it and so on and so forth. So there is a need for uh, cesses. So I would say, let us say you want a cess of 3%, you lower the direct tax rate uh, by that amount. So let's say the optimum tax rate, the peak tax rate is 20. Uh, and I, I would think you know, it should go be, be closer to 15. But let us say if the peak tax rate is 20, you have that the tax rate is 17 and sets of 3%. So the various ways, but you don't want the top rate or any rate um, to be non-competitive. Uh, right. That defeats the entire purpose. A quick note also, because we're talking about structural reforms, and I have to bring this up. There's been a lot of uh, criticism, perhaps, against the farm law. Some of it is misinterpreted. Some of it is misinformed. Everyone has a more, uh, their own perception of it. But if I talk about the farm laws, just as an example of the structural reforms the government has been taking out, there seems to be some sort of a 
challenge or resistance of sorts to these structural reforms from the government. How do you think the government should go forward tackling these? Well, if you're saying there is a uh, some resistance to structural reforms within the government, that is the case with every government in the world, uh, which brings about uh, reforms. Definitely, I, I presume you are talking correctly about democratic governments, and you'll yes. have a divergence of views within the government. There is. I don't know of any instance. I don't think the 91 reforms or the 97 tax reforms, since we're talking on taxes, did not have substantial portions of uh, people within the government opposed to those reforms. And that's as it should be. Uh, I have, you know, that's the nature of uh, democratic uh, politics. And actually that's the nature of ethical uh, politics. Everybody has a view, they should be able to articulate the view, they should have the freedom to articulate the view. They should have, uh, you know, um, prior to the government announcement, uh, there is a free discussion. As I believe, I was here in Washington. There was no way I would know, but I think the farm laws also, you know, the farm laws have been going on. Uh, the the quest, the demand for farm laws uh, for the change has been going on for now at least forty years. Um, you know, there have been numerous government reports. Every government has come out with a report on the farm laws. Now, um, my, you know, now that uh, the farm laws are stayed, etc., I think the government has what it has said a year, year and a half. I think uh, we should. Uh, my recommendation would be use this opportunity to have a full-scale uh, discussion and further reform. Uh, the entire system of MSPs and procurement needs to go a fundamental change. Um, what could some of the changes be? Um, one is, you know, which I would recommend that look, the, around the world, uh, farmers obtain subsidies. Okay, that's as it should be. The question is the equity behind the subsidies. Now, why should a Punjabi farmer or a UP farmer or a Lianbi farmer obtain a lot more of the subsidy than another citizen, uh, than another farmer? And uh, the peculiarity about the Indian system today is that, and study upon study has documented it, uh, is that it's only the very rich farmers of Punjab and Haryana that obtain the benefit. I mean, this is completely the opposite to any policy uh, anywhere in the world. Um, you know, it's like, um, okay, we'll identify the top 1% of farmers, the richest farmers in India, and we'll give them uh, procurement and subsidies. So I think we now have time. The government has bought itself time by saying, okay, uh, we'll bring about uh, in a year, year and a half. I think it can be a lot sooner than that. I think the debate can begin, discussion can begin right after the budget. Obviously, that's the number one priority right now, and it should be, and uh, come out with uh, you know, uh, a detail. It's a simplest solution um, that given that information, transportation, communication is very different than what it was, and production is very different than what it was in 1970 or 75, 76, when we came out with this uh, procurement regime, Food Corporation of India, et cetera. Now, you know, every place in India that produces wheat and rice um, has an ability to contribute to the central pool, which is used for distribution. I mean, how, how can anybody object to that? It's fair, it's equitable, it's efficient. So uh, if you have to distribute food, uh, why should it be the case that if a Madhya Pradesh, it goes to a storage ground and then is, uh, or take rice from Punjab, it goes to a storage and then it is transported to Kerala or to West Bengal. I mean, what's going on, guys? 
um, this is, you know, why don't you procure it from West Bengal farmers themselves and right. distribute it to West Bengal farmers or to Kerala farmers. So, um, and then, you know, so the last point I would want to make is, uh, given the opposition to the reforms, I mean, the, the states that should be dying to get it like West Bengal are not. Uh, uh, and they will benefit the most. Uh, their farmers will benefit the most. Their people will benefit the most. Their citizens will benefit the most. And they are, so uh, what it suggests is that uh, we have done something massively wrong with agriculture. Uh, that uh, the, you know, there are a hundred uh, million farmers in India, okay? Um, and very few of them uh, produce, I think Gulati had an estimate that only uh, 6% uh, yes. of the produce. So, you know, I did some studies showing it's the richest farmers um, that are getting massive amounts of subsidies because they produce more. I mean, you know, gone are the days when we didn't have irrigation and so on and so forth. Now, a large farmer produces that much more output and the yield of a large farmer is that much higher than the yield of a small farmer. You know, for decades, uh, the I my PhD thesis, one part was on farm productivity and how small farmers are more productive than large farmers. That was in the 60s. Um, you know, it's, uh, and you know, Amartya Sen and all these, uh, leading economists, we all participated, so Kumar Chakravarti, all participated in these debates and small farmers were more productive. Well, that was when they had better quality land and the large farmers had worse quality land. Uh, now, you know, 60 years later, we're still continuing. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I really think all of these facts can be put out in the open um, and take each issue that the farmers bring up, that the opposition economists bring up, that the opposition politicians bring up. And then come out with a reform, a further reform on procurement. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for those wonderful insights. I think uh, this is to be one budget that we should really look forward to. Thank you so much for insights and thank you for your time again. Thank you. I've got it.